glad that you are here, braving the effects of the tropical storm out there. Uh, so glad that you are here. Um, it's too soon in 2020 for tropical storms. I don't, I don't know. Or 2020 has no chill so far. So, um, but we are so excited that you are here. If you are joining us online this morning, again, we are so grateful that you have made it a part of your morning to be here. Uh, let's stand together. Let's pray. Let's begin this day in worship. God, we love you. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we have here on campus and online to lift up your name. God, I just pray that in this moment that we just, just leave all this outside stuff, all the things that are around our world, just to kind of set that aside for a moment to praise your name, to lift up your name in song and word and giving and God in fellowship. Everything that we have this morning, may we give it to you because you are worthy of our praise. God, we love you. We thank you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Is Lord of all. We praise his name today, here today, for being our hope. Aren't you so glad we can put our hope in him?
Praise the Lord. And yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's what Galatians 2.20 says. That is our life encapsulated in the Lord. So let's praise him today with this great song. It has been paid. 
Amen. Again, it's so good to see you, and I again see some new faces with us this week that have not been here uh, now in a long time, and welcome back. We are glad you are here. Those of you that are worshiping online, we are glad that you are joining us that way also. We want you to know we miss you, and uh, just as soon as you can feel safe, we've been praying for the Lord to uh, bring a peace to your heart that you can come out and join us when he brings that to you and you can join us in person. We'll be glad. You know, I personally have been kind of surprised with uh, still trying to maintain some kind of distance and not shaking hands or hugging like we all like to like to do. Nevertheless, it's still been so good to fellowship with people just to be able to to talk a little bit, to be able to see the color of your eyes and the smile on your face. Uh, I, you know, when they make a Zoom that can carry all that with it, well, then, you know, maybe it'll, it'll really be fun. But until then, being together is a lot, lot better. So those of you that are still worshiping with us uh, online, we're glad you are, but we want you to know we miss you and we are eager for you to be able to come back and join us that we may worship together. And again, good to see uh, some kids with us. Remember, it's okay to bring kids, grandkids, your kids, uh, bring them. They won't, they're, whatever distraction there is won't be a problem. We want to have them worshiping with us in either one of our, our services. Well, folks, I do not have to tell you what a time these last two weeks have been in our country. Just saddens my heart for all that is happening, beginning with the brutal murder of George Floyd, but then in all the aftermath that we continue to see. Since that tragic event, tens of thousands of people have protested peacefully, and I'm glad we're in a country where we can protest peacefully, and that right is provided, many of them just trying to express support and sympathy for the family and outrage at the way that he was killed. But sadly, there have been so many more brutal murders by people using this occasion to just accomplish their own purpose. There have been many, many more who have been injured, some of them given lifelong disabilities as a part of this. Many businesses privately owned have been thoroughly looted or have been burned to the ground. And while the, the violence has toned down a bit in the, in the last few days, the church still very much needs to stay at prayer. Folks, we have a big role to play in this. We need to pray. We need to pray when we come together. We need to pray when we are apart. But we need to pray. So I'm going to ask that all of us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's just bow our heads together and let's go before the Prince of Peace. Let's just plead for his intervention in our lives, but in the life of our nation, the lives of our people. 
And again, I'm, gonna, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to ask you, don't just listen to my prayer. Let my prayer just be a prompt. That if I say something that just stirs your spirit, leads you to think of something that you should express, would you just go ahead and pray that to the, the Lord when you're finished? Then, then you can pick up on any other word I might say that might lead you somewhere else. But I want each of us to be engaged in, in prayer. And Lord, we start out just by declaring our dependence upon you. Lord, we are a nation that is grateful for the day that we declared our independence from other men. But Lord, we never want to be independent of you. We declare that we depend upon you. In congregation, I would say, would you just do something? To indicate your dependence upon the Lord. Would you kneel at your seat or would you stand or would you lift hands or would you fold hands? Would you just do something to say, Lord, by doing this, I'm just declaring my total dependence upon you. Lord Jesus, I know apart from you, I can do nothing. And Lord, we come thanking you. Thanking you, Lord, for progress in ending the violence. We, we know it's not all ended, but Lord, things are better than they were. We give you glory for that, and we ask you, Lord, to continue to work. Lord, we pray for the families of all of those that in this sad period in our nation have lost loved ones. God, we pray for those that have been injured. We pray for those whose businesses have been destroyed, for those that have been looted, for those that as a consequence of these things have lost jobs or suffered other harm. Lord, we lift all of these up to you and ask you, Lord, to draw them to yourself. If they do not know you, Lord, bring somebody to come by and just say to them, I know someone who loves you and someone who can help. And Lord, I pray that you would wrap your arm of comfort and mercy and strength around them and give them, Lord, the help that they need. God, in the midst of all this, we pray for our law enforcement officers. Oh, Lord, what an impossible task they have to try to maintain or to impose law and order without taking actions that will provoke more hatred and violence. What a tightrope they try to walk. God, give them grace. And Lord, I pray that you would give them also protection as they try to protect our citizens. Lord, I pray for all of those on, on whatever sides there are in everything that we are experiencing right now, Lord, I, I'm not praying for one side over another, and there's not just two sides, but Lord, I pray for all of those right now that are battling with hatred and fighting with anger and who inside their soul is a boiling cauldron. God, I pray that they would find help and peace and resolution for that in you. Lord, I'm so grateful for the forgiveness you've provided. That you tell us that if we'll confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, together as a people of God, Lord, we come to pray against the evil one and against all of his minions. And Lord, we ask you to restrain them. God, they take a seed of anger and they grow it into a pine tree to fall across someone's life and kill them. Lord, the devil and his demons take a spark of anger and of hatred and they fan it into a raging fire that burns everyone and everything in its path. Hold them back, Lord. 
by your mighty power, stop them. Put an end to it and send them, Lord, to the pit. And Lord, for all of us who are called by your mighty name, Lord, would you restrain our own lust and improper desires? Would you settle the anger in our hearts? Lord, I pray that you would stop every root of bitterness from growing through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask you not only to restrain it, but to eliminate it. Lord, you live in us, you can take it away. And we give you every right to do so in our lives. Lord, let us not participate in sin. Let us not be a party to adding to the fury that destroys lives. And Lord, the anger that brings a nation down. God, we were, we are. We evermore shall be a people that just need you desperately. Father, would you work within us? Would you work around us? Lord, would you be pleased to work through us? Lord, for our good, for the good of our nation, and for your glory. And these things we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You know, folks, since we have been personally caught up in the coronavirus and the COVID-19, we have been focusing our attention on the faithfulness of God. But I suspect that some looking at the events the past two weeks in our nation have said, well, where in the world do we see the faithfulness of God in all of this? And what I want to say to you this morning is that in times of extreme trial and difficulty and tribulation like we have been seeing, that it is the faithfulness of God that shines as a single brilliant light in a dark, dark sky. And in our world today, and especially in the United States of America, we have certainly seen things grow darker and darker in these recent days. But just as the brightest star cannot be seen if one's eyes are focused upon the ground, so also we need to know where to look. We must know where to look if we are to see the faithfulness of God shining down when the obscuring clouds of sin are all around us. Folks, the place we can always see the faithfulness of the Almighty is in his word. And so today I want to take you to one of the grandest expressions of the love, the mercy, and the faithfulness of God that can be found in all the scriptures. It's in the book of Romans in chapter 5, beginning in verse 18, where it says, Therefore, as through one Man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience... Many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, 
But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now just walk with me for a minute through this passage. Paul is talking about two cataclysmic events that took place in all of human history. You know, if you had asked me a few months ago, well, Brother Mike, what are the two most cataclysmic events that have happened just during your lifetime? I'd have said in a, without a heartbeat between us, Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Michael. <laughs> those, were, those were my two cataclysmic events because of just the impact they, they had on me personally, on my family, those around me. I suspect that in more recent days, people living in New York, if you ask them what the most cataclysmic event they've ever experienced was, many of them would say COVID-19, unless they lived in one of those parts of the city devastated by the recent riots, then they'd probably say the death of George Floyd. But folks, none of these events compare in significance at all to the events that the Holy Spirit draws our attention to in the passage that we just read through the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. One man's offense. Talking about Adam's disobedience. Adam making the choice that go, though God had said of this one fruit of the tree of the garden, of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. His disobedience to say, I will eat of it. That was the first cataclysmic event. And the second one, one man's righteous act. He is talking about Jesus' death upon the cross. And we might ask, well, well I, I know those are important, but, but why are those the most significant events in history? Why is he singling out these, these two things? Are they really more important than man's discovery of fire? Do they mean more than the worldwide flood or the, the domination of the Roman Empire or even the Protestant Reformation? Why are these more important than all the other things across history that we might point to as having wide effects upon mankind? Well, verse 19 explains the reason. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Listen, folks, we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. I mean, we, we know where we're related to Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, but we were related even before we came to Christ. We're related by blood, and we are related across all racial and ethnic lines. There is one blood in all mankind. We are all descended from Adam and Eve. And because we are, Adam's sin affected us. We have inherited from Adam the sin nature. And that's what the Bible's talking about, that we were made sinners because of this one act on Adam's part his disobedience. And so right before this passage, the scripture tells us, for all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then right after this passage, we read, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the first cataclysmic event was Adam's disobedience that made us all sinners. 
But the second cataclysmic event was by one man's obedience. Many will be made righteous because on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ paid the death penalty for every single one of us. You know that one of my favorite verses in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's God the Father made Jesus Christ who had no sin in his life to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now I want you to think about this with me for a minute. Folks, this is no, not merely a theological construct for us to think about when we're in a Bible mood. This is about what is happening in our nation today. Because our sins were punished, were paid for, when God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus Christ, when all the sin of the world was put upon him, that means that every man, every woman, every teenager, every boy, every girl can have their sin forgiven and be made righteous in Christ. Because of God's faithfulness to keep his promises for those who are in Christ, there will be no more penalty for sin. All the penalty for sin will be taken away. And there will be forgiveness for all of our sin. Listen, for every sinful act we have ever committed... For every sinful thought that has ever passed through our mind. For every sinful word that has come from our mouth. For every sinful motive that has been in our heart. For things that have been done in public. For things that have only been done in private. Yet there is forgiveness for sin. Now, I want you to just think about what has happened in our country the last two weeks. Do you understand this means that forgiveness is available to every person who has committed murder in these last two weeks? Forgiveness has been made available to all of those who have injured others. Forgiveness has been made available to the great multitude who have harbored and acted out of hatred. Forgiveness is available to those who have harbored and acted out of racism. Forgiveness is available to those who stole, for those who burned, and for all of those who hated others because they did those things. For all who have sinned as a part of this whole mess, forgiveness is available because of what Christ did upon the cross. But folks, because of the cross, not only is the penalty for sin paid for those who are in Christ, not only is forgiveness for every sin made available, but also because of what Christ did upon the cross, the power to forgive others is made available as well. Folks, think with me about this. What if George Floyd's daughter, Gianna, were to go to the jail with her mother where Derek Chauvin is right now. She went up to the jail and looked at that man and said, I forgive you. What if she said, 
what you did was wrong, but I forgive you. You took away my daddy. I'll not have him at my graduation. He'll not be there to walk me down the aisle when I get married. But I forgive you. I'll never see my daddy become a grandpa and he'll he'll never be able to say how beautiful my kids are or how smart they are. He'll never be able to play hide and seek with them. But I forgive you. And what if Anne-Marie Doran found the man who shot her husband? His name was David. He was a retired police captain. And he had just come out because an alarm went off at the shop of a friend. And he went to check on it and was murdered by someone who was breaking in and robbing. And what if she went down to the jail and found the man that had shot her husband? And said, I forgive you. He said, you know, I don't, I don't understand why because of the murder of one black man, you would murder another black man. But nevertheless, I forgive you. Well, she said, you know, you'll never understand what you took away from me. Right here in the most vulnerable years of my life. But I forgive you. But what if the mother of Italia Kelly, who was a young woman who herself had been participating in the protest, But the one that she was at was starting to get unruly and she thought, I need to get home. And she left and went to her car and as she reached out and grabbed the door handle, a bullet hit her in the back and she died. What if Italia's mother found the man or the woman, they don't know which now. But what if she found that person that shot that gun and Her innocent daughter, not even a part of the conflict, was killed. And looked them in the eye and said, I forgive you. You've taken my baby away. 22 years old. And you've put her in the grave. But I forgive you. She was so smart. Had such a big, bubbly personality. So much fun to be with. But you took her from me. But I forgive you. Folks, I don't know if any of those things will ever happen. I certainly don't know for sure if any of the people that have lost loved ones who themselves have been injured, some beyond imagination, or even some who have
lost businesses they worked for their entire lives. Those that have lost jobs because of that that can't be replaced. I don't know if any of the vast, vast numbers of people who have been immeasurably wronged through all of this. I don't know for certain if any of them will ever be able to say to the people that did it, I forgive you. But they could. (laughs) They could. And I suspect that some of them will. But the thing that I want us to all see this morning, the thing that I believe it is so critical for us to understand, or if we already understand, critical for us to remember, is that such a scenario is possible that these people who have been so grievously wronged, even with the death of the people closest to them in life, They could look that person in the eye and say with genuineness of heart, I forgive you, but they can only do it because of the cross. Because Jesus paid the penalty for sin upon the cross. And that's what makes it possible. You see, because Jesus paid the penalty for sin, God the Father can forgive all of those who have done all this wrong. And think about it. You know, God God loves George Floyd more than Gianna or any of the rest of his family ever could. God loved David Dorn more than Anne Marie. God loved Italia more than her mother and all the rest of her family and friends. And yet God can forgive those that murdered them. And he can do it because his son went to the cross. And allowed all of their sin to be placed upon him. And he died and paid the penalty for that sin once and for all. So God can grant forgiveness. Do you know God can do that in your life? God can do that in your life for the person who has done the very worst thing, who said the very worst thing, who's been the person that when you think about sinners and offenders and folks that hurt, God can give you the power to forgive them because of the cross. And that's why The Spirit moves Paul to say, because of one man's obedience, because of Jesus' death upon the cross, many will be made righteous. And he is talking about salvation, but he's not just talking about salvation. He means we have the power to forgive Because of what Jesus did on the cross. (laughs) So we are not condemned. And all of these that have been hurt and offended so grievously in what has happened in our country are not condemned to live their lives in anger and hatred continually and with a root of bitterness deep down within their soul that they can't get out. They're not condemned to that because of the cross. Because of the cross, they can forgive. We can be forgiven. We can forgive others. And the result is many 
will be made righteous. That's why in verse 20 of this passage it said, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. Folks, God can make that happen in our lives. God can even make that happen in our nation. Might say, but how? Well, he tells us that too in verse 21. By ending with these words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now folks, let me tell you something. God is always faithful to keep his promises. Amen? But God keeps his promises exactly. We can't change a word or two here or there. We can't make the conditions a little easier. If God puts conditions on a promise, then for him to keep it, the conditions have to be exactly met. And God has promised his faithfulness to forgive and to give the power to forgive. But that promise is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so again, a little after this passage in Romans 10, verse 9, the Spirit says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be made righteous. You will be forgiven. You will have the power to forgive others when they sin, no matter how badly against you. If you confess Jesus as Lord and you believe that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. <clears throat> As we stand with our heads bowed before the Lord. <clears throat> my friend if you're here today you have never come to that moment in your life to invite Jesus to become the Lord which means the master the boss the ruler of your life but you believe he died for your sin you believe he rose from the dead and today you want all of this that is available by trusting in him you want the penalty for your sin to be paid once for all. You want forgiveness for every wrong thing you've ever done or thought. You want the power to even be able to forgive others that have hurt you. You want to live with him forever. Then you can trust him this morning. You can invite him to become the Lord of your life. Just right where you stand, just pray this prayer with me. You can pray it silently. The Lord will hear the cry of your heart. Just say, dear Jesus, I do know that I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And Jesus, I believe you're that Savior. I believe you're God's Son. Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Today I turn away from my sin. I repent of it all. And I invite you to come into my life. I want you to be my Lord, my Master, my Savior. Today, I begin to follow you. Now, just keep your heads bowed. We're going to continue our prayer in just a moment. But if you prayed that prayer today, inviting Jesus to become the Lord and Master of your life, when you leave here in a minute, would you go over to the, the Next Steps desk? Just tell the pastor that will be there, 
what you've done. Let him help you in taking the next step in your new faith in Christ. If what you just did was real, if you really mean it, then when we're dismissed, just go over there and tell him. Let him share with you just the next step of what to do now that you've trusted Christ. Now for all the rest of us that have trusted him some many years ago, just continue in this prayer with me for a moment. Father, those of us who have come to faith in Christ, we just want to thank you. Thank you again for being obedient even to the death on the cross. Thank you for paying the price for our sin by becoming sin for us, Lord Jesus. Lord, I can't even imagine. What it must have been like. You who have always been called holy, holy, holy. To suddenly be made sin. All we can say is thank you. We're so grateful. We see the marvelous blessings made available to us that none of us could have had. We couldn't have been forgiven. We couldn't have gone to live with you in heaven. We would have no power to forgive others and we would be bitter, angry, resentful people for all of our lives. Except Jesus for what you did on the cross. We thank you. Now, Lord, for those of us that may be struggling with forgiving someone, maybe for something recent, maybe for something years and years back, Lord, we stand before you to say we know you give us the power to forgive. And Lord, we commit ourselves to use that power. We commit ourselves to use the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us to honor you by forgiving those who have sinned against us. We yield our lives for your continuous change and transformation and ask you, Lord, each and every day to work in us and through us to bring glory to your name. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue just to make our commitments to the Lord and worship him while we sing.
Savior, he will say, I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won and I shall guys can have a seat for just a moment. As, uh, as we reflect on today's message, let us remember that one of the ways that we worship our Lord, one of the ways that we show our trust in our sovereign God is through our giving. So we're going to take a moment uh, to talk through that, to have a, a prayer about how we worship and how we trust and how we give. Uh, in that way, if you are worshiping with us online, you can give uh, by text. Uh, you can go to our website at sabc.org and give that way, or you can mail uh, a check into the church. Let me pray for our offering this week. Father, we truly are grateful for the forgiveness that you offer us. Lord, I can't even fathom how you're able to do that. But God, I thank you for that. Lord, and I, I worship you. I worship you through my giving. God, not because you need what I have. You're a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God, you own it all. But I give because of worship. I give because it's an act of obedience. I give because I want to be a good steward of what you have given me, Lord. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would take this offering, Lord. That you would use it in a way that would, that would reach our world with the glorious gospel. God, may we speak truth. May we speak truth and love as we go out from this place. God, there are so many things that we can do, 
But Lord, if we do these things without love, we will be like a clanging cymbal. Help us not be that. Father, as we reflect on the forgiveness that you have offered us, as we think about how grateful we are, God, would we be encouraged, would we be moved to forgive others? God, start with us right here. Do a work in our lives, in our church, in this body. God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.